welcome everyone, uh, and welcome to Berkeley, those who have come from afar. My name is Jake Dalton, and I teach Tibetan Buddhism here at Berkeley. It's really good to see all of you here, and I hope all your travels went smoothly. I know California is a long way off. Uh, it's really far from almost everything else perched out here on the edge of the world as it is, and it took many hours for some of you to get here. So thank you for your prodigious efforts just in getting here. Unfortunately, I, I feel I have to say something uh, about uh, my outrage at the absence of one of us, um, uh, Soyolma Davaku, who, a wonderful Mongolian artist who was turned back at the San Francisco airport uh, and sent back to Mongolia by our beloved airport agents. Uh, apparently her treatment was uh, really deplorable and it's, I, I have to say, just shameful that this country is now one in which artists are subjects of suspicion. Anyway, to those who attended this afternoon's event, I apologize for her absence and thank you, Orna, for uh, soldiering on without her. All right, with that I return to a, a more celebratory note. Um, it's really good that we're all here, that we are all here. Um, and that we can spend the next two days appreciating each other's company and what I'm sure will be some stimulating conversations. As you know, Berkeley has a long history of Buddhist studies from its earlier incarnation under Professors Jaini and Lancaster to its more recent rebirth under Professors uh, Robert Scharf and Alex von Rospat. It must be admitted, however, that Mongolian Buddhism has played a relatively small role in our program. This is unfortunate. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I continue anyway. This lack certainly does not reflect the real importance of Mongolia and the history of Buddhism in both East and Inner Asia. It's hoped that the present event may begin to correct this imbalance, and I must thank the Center for Buddhist Studies for its generous support. In fact, this conference is one in a series of larger and smaller scale events that we've uh, been hosting over the past few years, all of which have been mounted uh, under the auspices of our larger Mongolia initiative. And with this initiative, we've been trying to build up Mongolia studies here, uh, both, both here at Berkeley and, of course, around the world more generally. Our past conferences have touched on a broad range of topics from Mongolian archaeology to the Mongolian environment, uh, the Mongolian empire, and so on. All of these events, as well as our present conference on Mongolian Buddhism, have been made possible thanks to a generous grant from the Mongolian government we received a few years ago. And uh, the resulting Mongolia initiative um, has a steering committee of dedicated members, but it must be said, uh, normally this is left for the end of a conference, but I must say it now, that one person has really spearheaded this whole thing, and that is Caverly Carey. I'm sure all of you have been in contact with her. I'm sure you, you've already been in contact with her, and this entire event would not have happened without her remarkable level, level of interest and enthusiasm, not to mention organizational skills. So thank you for all you've done, Caverly. In recent years, we've su supplemented our funding from the Mongolian government with another grant from the U.S. federal government's National Resource Centers, the NRC program. And that program has enabled us to host some additional lectures and other events. But most importantly, it has allowed us to hire Dr. Brian Bauman, whom I imagine many of you know. Brian has been teaching a variety of courses uh, on Mongolian language and culture. And uh, let me take this opportunity also to say what a pleasure it's been to have him here, and I truly hope we can find ways to keep him here for many years to come. And with that, I pass the baton to Brian, who will come to the front to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Johan Elverskog. So thank you again for coming, and have a wonderful conference. So, uh, Johan Elverskog, is professor and chair of religious studies at Southern Methodist University. His graduate degrees he takes from Indiana University. His baccalaureate comes from Berkeley, of course. 
where else? <laughs> at, at Indiana, his focus was Mongolian studies, a subject which elsewhere is often sprinkled lightly throughout the academic curriculum, like sea salt on a cracker. Uh, but there uh, held considerable gravity for a time. So to bear this gravity required well-rounded discipline. It is very difficult to outright master all the languages and fields of study necessary to be a competent scholar of something as vast as the Mongol Empire. The gravity to that field crushes all of us. Uh, is that okay? <laughs> Yeah, but there was no way to do Mongolian studies in Bloomington without considerable multilinguistic, interdisciplinary training. So Johann's research covers Mongolian studies broadly from the Mongol Empire to the present. His focus has been Mongolian history and culture through the sources of its literary language. This language belongs to a Buddhist world. To live in it, in addition to Mongolian and whatever research languages he knows, Johann took up Buddhist studies as well as Tibetan, Chinese, and, essential for Mongolian Buddhism, Old Uyghur. From this core discipline, he has been able to progress further afield into religious studies and Central Eurasian studies broadly. So the Silk Road is just an alley that runs through his backyard. <laughs> so, so for the kin, his discipline affords him. Johann sees the cosmopolitan nature of the humanities with keenness and a broad scope. And seeing the humanities as well as he does, he positions his publications at strategic points of historical intersection. His first book, Uyghur Buddhist Literature, compiles and annotates extant Uyghur sources and so opens a gateway for us to the comparative textual study that reveals the cultural nuances that enlivened Buddhism's transmission. His Jewel Translucent Sutra not only translates the principal source to the Mongols' conversion to Galupa Buddhism under the Tumid Lord Alton Han, his thorough, cogent, ancillary work on the text makes this particular study an indispensable source for 16th century East Asian history. And his Buddhism and Islam on the Silk Road sees an elephant in the room, or on the Silk Road, as it were, and gives it the attention it deserves. So, in positioning his publications at these strategic intersections, rather than finding the narrowest possible defile and setting up a toll booth or road bo a roadblock to admittance, Johann's works undergo the hard work of making a way across the sometimes steep and rocky passes that separate fields and then graciously carry us across on lucid, enjoyable prose. So as his publications bring fields and scholars together, his service does too. Johann gets around, uh, he knows everyone, he cultivates good scholarship, uh, he puts people in touch with each other, organizes panels, he contributes to collected essay volumes as he did with his important article on gender studies, whatever happened to Queen Jungen in Buddhism in Mongolian history, culture, and society, edited by Vesna Wallace. Uh, and he puts together his own collected essay volumes too, as he did in Wu Tai Shan and Qing culture and biographies of eminent Mongol Buddhists. As a graduate student at Indiana University, he co founded a truly remarkable international conference for Central Eurasian Studies, which I now believe is on its way to 25 years running in his absence. He made it so well, it can, it can go on without him. So, Johan and I studied together at IU. He was ahead of me uh, by a few years. I used his approach to a dissertation as the model for my own. For those of you who have not read him, Johan writes copious notes uh, to make annotations that serve effectively to elucidate and, av ad and advance a reader's engagement with a text requires art. And Johan's footnotes are absolutely the best I know. <laughs> that, 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 it's true. So today he will launch our conference with a keynote address titled Tantric Buddhism and Mongol Law. Please welcome him, Johan Elver Scott. Wow. That was a... I'm touched. A very, very... Um, Remarkable introduction. In a certain sense, there's no way that I can live up to all of those words. I mean, the Silk Road's an alley in my backyard. Um, <laughs> don't tell that the Silk Road Studies program back here. Um, <clears throat> wow. Um, 
again, thank you, very, thank you, Brian. Um, but I'd like to begin by thanking um, well all of you for being being here. I know there's many other things and many other places you can be, so it truly is an, uh, want an honor that you came out to hear this talk in this on a Thursday afternoon. I also want to thank all the um, the people who made this conference possible, beginning with the government of Mongolia, Professor Dalton, Professor Berger, Professor Bauman, Caverly, and Jenny, and everything everybody else. I also want to thank all of um, the my my co presenters, what are we, co cohort um, panelists, um, who I know that they all deserve to be up here m more than I do. Um, and I felt kind of bizarre or bad that I was given this. It's a wonderful honor. But at the same time, I know that all of them could be giving just um, giving this talk. Um, and that, I, thinking using Buddhist logic, I think the only reason that it happened is, you know, Jake pulled my name out of a golden urn or something like that. that you're the one who's going to do it. Um, but so with that said, um, let me turn to the topic at hand, um, which is um, Buddhism and law. Before turning to the specific topic of Buddhism and, or, uh, Buddhism and Mongol law, I hope you'll indulge me and maybe building on Brian's, take you down the sideways of, of the interdisciplinary humanity questions. And particularly what I want to go into is the his, historiographical thicket that is Mongolian Buddhism, which is, some, which is something of my ballywick. And thus, in, in this particular forum, and particularly, I mean, at this conference, which is specifically promoting Mongolian Buddhism at the world's premier center for Buddhist studies, I feel that it's pertinent to lay out some of the most salient issues so that we are all kind of on the same page, so we all know what we're talking about, since we all do come from different fields. Um, and invariably, issues that I will raise today will be reflected in the talks that will be coming over the next two days. Um, and essentially, I think these are also issues that are pertinent to the very issue of Mongolian Buddhism, namely what it is and what it was. Since, these, since answering these questions are not only part of the purview of this conference, but it is obviously also an issue for the Mongols themselves, who are currently valiantly trying to revive Mongolian Buddhism after 70 years of official Soviet athe atheism. And thus, to get to the point, and by doing so quite frankly, the fact of the matter is, is that there is something of an existential angst at the very heart of Mongolian Buddhism. And this is not only in terms of the study of Mongolian Buddhism, and that's what we may want to call the academic institutionalization of the field, but also quite specifically, and no doubt more importantly, in its lived reality among the Mongols in Mongolia today. Thus, let me begin with the study dimension of the problems, it is the one that I know better than the other. Since, as you can well imagine, I myself, personally, am not a Mongolian Buddhist. Indeed, whether or not I actually can be a Mongolian Buddhist, and what that would actually mean or entail, is basically the root of the problem. Thus, unlike the case of, say, Tibetan Buddhism, where it is quite readily understandable for most people if I were to say to them, I'm a Tibetan Buddhist. That's not necessarily the case with Mongolian Buddhism. Since, as we all know, Tibetan Buddhism is kind of an academic and socio-cultural juggernaut that has been stripped of its ethno-national roots and been universalized in the global marketplace of religions. Yet such a phenomenon has obviously not happened in the case of Mongolian Buddhism. It is not, as I like to say, ethnically hip. Why this is the case, and more importantly, why Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism continues to thrive in popular culture has, of course, been studied by numerous scholars and need not detain us here. Rather, the point is simply to make clear that for whatever reason, this dynamic has not happened in the case of Mongolian Buddhism. Of course, that is not to say that it can't happen. Indeed, just as there is now, has now developed a distinct market from Mongolian Buddhist art, perhaps there may also develop a cadre of jet-set Mongolian lamas teaching the Dharma to avid Western converts. But until then, let us turn to the reverse, or perhaps the original phenomenon, namely the commonplace notion that Mongols practice Tibetan Buddhism. And thus, by extension, we may very well ask, why are we even having this conference? Why not just have it another conference of Tibetan Buddhism and have a, a sprinkling, or as you use the analogy, salt on a cracker, a bunch of Mongolists among the Tibetanists? Or to be even more brutally frank, which is kind of another one of my MOs, let's take the discussion into the academic realm, where, as everyone knows, recognition, status, and value is invariably ranked according to endowed chairs. Who has it? Who doesn't? 
What does it mean? Who paid for it? Thus, can we rightfully ask, should there be a chair of Mongolian Buddhism? Or to further problematize the issue, let's imagine the day when Robert Thurman retires from the J. Tsongkhapa Chair in Indo-Tibetan Studies at Columbia University. Can or should that position be filled by someone who works on Mongolian Buddhism? And I ask that question not because I have any, any vested interest in such a thing. Indeed, who would want to live on a bunch of with the billionaires on the Upper West Side? <laughs> but rather, I ask it from the simple but ever so important perspective of academic boundaries. And as such, is Mongolian Buddhism within the purview of that chair's somberly titled Indo-Tibetan Buddhism? Of course, the term Indo-Tibetan Buddhism itself is a term with an intellectual history, one that obviously tries to elide or downplay Sino-Tibetan realities, and one that coincidentally now seems to be out, out, out on, on the way out in general academic discourse. And you know, mentioning IU, I recently saw the ad advertisement for my teacher, Professor Elliot Sperling, um, the, his position, he unfortunately passed away. Um, they're advertising it and they're mandating that the Tibetan positions do Chinese, which seems to be a, a, a new direction of where Tibetan studies is going. Regardless, returning to the question of Robert Thurman's chair, what I think is interesting about asking this question is, is the fact that Professor Thurman's teacher, guru, or lama, whatever you want to call it, was of course not Tibetan. Geshe Wangyal was Mongol, as was Lama Agwanima, who was instrumental in institutionalizing the study of Tibetan Buddhism in Europe. Of course, some may say, including presumably Professor Thurman himself, that such ethnic or national concerns are beside the point. Rather, the Dharma, or more specifically in Thurman's case, the Galukpa, readily transcends such superfluous social and genetic concerns. And thus, whether Geshe Yang Wangyal was a Mongol or Tibetan is completely beside the point. But what if he had been Chinese? And in thinking about this, I think it's important to remember that the very reason that there were Kalmuk Mongols in New Jersey that, that Thurman could study with is that after World War II, thinking again about the, what happened with the Mongol artist who was rejected, the reason that they were allowed into the United States after World War II is that they claimed that they were from the Caucasus, and thereby on their passports they were listed as being Caucasian, and therefore that's why they were accepted. <laughs> Thus, of course, here at Berkeley, I studied here in the 1980s. As we all know, the construction of identity is a tricky business. Of course, at the same time, as a mountain of scholarship on the dynamics of accommodation, acculturation, and localization has argued, these things matter. Indeed, it is in relation to this intellectual paradigm, as well as the post-World War II area studies modeled, funded by the DOD and the CIA, that the whole field of Buddhist studies is essentially organized. And thus, we're all aware that differences between what, for lack of a better word, are identified as national Buddhisms. There's Chinese Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, Korean Buddhism, etc. For example, here at Berkeley, again, the world's premier center for Buddhist studies, the faculty is organized, hired, or whatever you want to call it, largely by regional focus in additioning um, to various disciplinary boundaries. Thus, if you go down the list, there's China, Japan, Tibet, Cambodia, India, Japan, Nepal, and China. Of course, at the same time, all of these scholars, and everyone in Buddhist studies, invariably grapples with the tensions between the universal and the local, as well as within the inherent continuities and discontinuities that define the historical development of any religious tradition. But be that as it may, the question still remains, what of Mongolian Buddhism? Since as this quote from Donald Lopez, who is one of the world's leading and certainly the best known and most prolific scholars of Buddhism has put it, Mongols are simply Tibetan Buddhists. Of course, as some of you know, I have long questioned this assumption. In particular, following the mandates of emic knowledge, I have noted that in no Mongolian source does a term or category such as Tibetan Buddhism exist. Moreover, in the same way as we can say both Tibetans, or at least some of them, and Mongols follow the Galukpa tradition, just as we can say that Burmese and Thais follow the Theravada tradition, no one would blithely assert that on account of this fact that Burmese are Thai Buddhists, or vice versa. Thus, we can rightfully ask, why is it different in the case of Tibetan Buddhism? How can the late Buddhist Tantra created in Tibet be tied to both a distinct cultural, ethno-national, territorial, and political entity, and simultaneously be, di be dissociated from that distinct reality? 
Indeed, should we not query the accuracy of this representation and ask whether such terminology obscures more than it explains? Moreover, from my own perspective, what I find most interesting is whether there are any historiographical implications in maintaining such a framework. In particular, by making such claims, do we obviate the existence of an autochthonous and autonomous Mongolian Buddhism? Of course, it is precisely this question that lies at the heart of the angst that I mentioned earlier. And this is not simply an academic question, but it is also one that is shaping the discourses about the current revival in Mongolia today. Since invariably, the one fundamental question that any such nostalgia-fueled revival entails is precisely the question, what are we actually reviving? But again, that is not my world, or as I, some people can say, I don't have any skin in that game. Just let me return to the game that I am involved with, namely the academic study of Tibetan Buddhism, or Mongolian Buddhism. See, it slips right there. In particular, let me turn simply to the very name Mongolian Buddhism, since as many of you know, there's a long history revolving around the naming of this particular phenomenon. Early Western sources following indigenous precedent, for example, wrote about the yellow religion, referring to the Gelugpa. Other more recent sources, on the other hand, such as Walter Heisig's influential work, speak of Lamaism. Yet when that term fell out of favor in the academy, it was largely and no doubt uncritically replaced by the term Tibetan Buddhism, which of course is now being challenged by many who are advocating for an autochthonous Mongolian Buddhism. And of course this includes me, but also I presume most of the participants in this conference. Yet I have to confess that as I'm getting older, grayer, longer in the tooth, I'm also starting to waver in my fundamentalist min mil militancy of my youth. In fact, several years ago, I started publicly proposing a revival of the term Lamaism. As you can see, very small there, the, my talk, The Case for Lamaism, in 2009. Why I made this argument, or why I thought we should start talking about Lama is again, Lamaism again, is complicated. But one impetus was my graduate school mentor's adoption of the ethnically neutral, but tradition-specific neologism, Tibetan Rite Buddhism, which even though I sympathized with the, with the intellectual sentiment behind it, really could not get behind either, because it, it's, and nor to my knowledge did anyone else in the scholarly community adopt this circumlocution, even though Professor Atwood used it in his widely influential Encyclopedia of the Mongols. Yet even more important than Atwood's new term in changing my thinking about what to call this thing that was technically my field of study was my concurrent questioning of the whole ethnic turn enterprise. Of course, the ethnic turn had been instrumental in the development of the revolutionary work of the so-called New Qing history, which greatly influenced my own work and indeed virtually everyone else who was working on late imperial China. However, at a certain point, my interest in asserting and maintaining ethnic identities was dampened by my vicarious experience of the Bosnian War on account of the fact that my wife is from Sarajevo. Thus, rather than seeing the value in promoting a theoretical model like Mark Elliott's ethnic sovereignty, I started to question it. In particular, I started to think that the ethnic ghettoization inherent in much of the New Qing history paradigm was actually obscuring deeper structural and institutional factors that actually made the Manchu Empire work. And in short, it was this idea that fueled my work on Qing cosmopolitanism which tried to bring forth the dynamics of cross-cultural and cross-ethnic dynamics that shaped Qing culture. And of course, in this context, Buddhism was one of these facets. And thus, Lamaism, rather than Tibetan or Mongolian Buddhism, seemed to open up more intellectual space to actually perceive, talk about, and make sense of these dynamics. Of course, as everyone in this room probably knows, the term Lamaism is one that has been roundly vilified by contemporary scholars as a colonial construct, a pseudo-Protestant critique of Catholicism, et cetera, et cetera. So in short, it has for several decades been a term that has been generally avoided. But why should it be? Indeed, in my defense of this suggestion, let me say that one of the main reasons that I actually started even pondering the idea of resurrecting the term was a comment made to me by Shamar Rinpoche, who obviously, to use the appropriate jargon, 
is a native who, unlike me, a white male outsider, Shamar Rinpoche actually has the right to name his own tradition. And thus what happened is that one day we were looking at this massive, one of these genealogical murals being painted at the Karmapa Center in New Delhi. And he turned to me and said, Westerners used to call it Lamaism, but now they don't. But you know, the Lama is very important. And thus I think calling it Lamaism is, makes sense. Whether this is reason enough to revive the term is certainly open to debate. However, I think it is an issue worth considering. Of course, as the title of my paper also conveys, I'm not sure whether I'm fully committed to making this linguistic leap. And this is not because I do not think it would serve a useful intellectual purpose. However, the simple fact of the matter is that my scholarly interests have recently changed yet again. Thus now, when I'm interested in what I'm interested in or when I am interested in precisely the question of how the Tibetan Buddhist tradition became Mongolian, I am again wavering on the value of Lamaism. Yet as the title of my paper also belies, I'm also hedging my bets on Mongolian Buddhism as well. But this is something that I want to return to later. Thus, let me turn instead to the specific question of accommodation or acculturation in the case of Mongolia, um, which in my case is obviously profoundly influenced by the far more developed and sophisticated scholarship on the Tibetan tradition itself, which was forged out of the tradition or traditions that can be called Tantra, late Indian, Kashmiri, Pala Buddhism, whatever. Regardless, what has interested me is precisely how or whether a similar process occurred among the Mongols especially regard, regarding the question of whether it was somehow hindered or problematized by either the Qing state or something else, such as the idealizations of pure Mongolness that saturate scholarship in both the East and the West. And since this is an important factor in the study of Mongolian Buddhism, and one that may not necessarily be well known outside the guild, let me say a few words, a few words about it. In particular, I want to call out the romantic uh, blood and soil scholarship of Walter Heisig, since he is obviously such a towering figure in the field. Whether he's a full-blown Nazi, I'll leave others to answer. However, as is well known, on account of his activities during the war, he was never subsequently allowed to travel to the United States. Regardless, as anyone who has read his work knows, Heisig hated Buddhism. For him, it was a foreign abomination that subverted the true, pure, the true pure nomadic heritage of the Mongols, a view that, of course, in various ways paralleled the argument of Chinese statecraft, which said that supporting the Dharma among the Mongols would stop their warlike nature. It also neatly paralleled the kind of the human two-tier model of religion that saw Lamaism as simply a veneer of Buddhism covering a deep-seated and eternal shamanic core. And while this two-tier model has been problematized in scholarship across the Buddhist world, it is invariably one that we need to keep in mind, since in the case of Mongolia, and with the reality of Manchu rule, it is a framework that cut in both ways, both positive and negative. Indeed, it was clearly this whole concatenation of ideas that came in turn to shape both Marxist and national historiography in Mongolia itself, whereby the Dharma came to be constructed as not only a vehicle of Manchu colonialism, but also a distortion of true Mongol culture and social values. Indeed, as everyone knows, Chinggis Khan was not a Buddhist. And thus, these questions of what Mongolian Buddhism was and how it shaped are quite possibly distorted, subverted, and quite possibly made worse, Mongolian culture is not simply an academic question. Since in many ways, it is such issues that shape the dynamics of the current return or revival of Buddhism in Mongolia. As this quote from a Mongol Christian convert makes abundantly clear, if my father had not been forced out of the monastery during the brutal purges of the 1930s, I would never have been born. If Mongolia had not been a nation of celibate monks following a religion forced on us by the Manchus to keep us weak, we would be a strong nation of 40 million people today. In many ways, uh, to my mind at least, this quote gets to the heart 
of the current revival and the historiographical challenges at hand. Since they, the Mongol Buddhists themselves, and also presumably us academics as well, we have to answer these questions. And this includes the important question of whether Buddhism is actually good, which asking that question in Berkeley can probably get me beaten up or something, I don't know. <laughs> Very Buddhist for them to do that, but no. Um, indeed, as everyone knows, Buddhism has a resoundingly positive image in both academic and popular discourses. And of course, there's a whole mountain of scholarship exploring why this is the case and how it potentially distorts our understanding of Buddhism's role in Asian history. But even so, as a whole, the expansion of the Dharma is rarely seen as something bad. Instead, its spread is often presented like 19th century European tracts uh, justifying colonialism. Thus, the Dharma brought art, technology, technology, writing, and all of this stuff to those benighted people on the periphery. And in a certain sense, that's all true. But still, in this particular post-colonial moment, can you imagine if any other social, cultural, religious, or political system were to cover as much territory as the Dharma did, that there wouldn't have been a slew of studies exploring the implications and dynamics of such an expansion? Yet, of course, on account of the positive cachet that the Dharma employ, enjoys in both the popular and academic imagination, this has not happened. And I think this needs to change. Indeed, we may need to ask, is Mongolian Buddhism a good thing, culturally, religious, religiously, even morally? In thinking about these issues, what has intrigued me of late is the question of how and whether Buddhism did actually change Mongolian society. And as just noted, this can theoretically be for the better or for the worse. Either way, what has interested me is whether, through an exploration of this dynamic, we can rightfully argue that there was or is something called Mongolian Buddhism. Since only then can we begin discussing the question of whether such a thing is good or bad. Thus, in order to begin this exploration, I've recently been looking precisely at how Buddhism engaged and transformed Mongolian culture. And one example of this work that Professor Bauman mentioned is an article on Queen Jongin that was published in the ex excellent volume edited by Professor Wallace. And broadly, what this article tries to investigate is the impact Buddhism had on Mongolian women. Since, as many of you may know, Mongol women traditionally had a great deal of power. And this was true all the way from the earliest days of the empire up through Queen Jongin, who was the wife of Alton Khan in the 16th century. Yet, as the article argues, this tradition came to an abrupt end with the introduction of the Dharma. Specifically, on account of the Dharma's rejection of the millennia-old inter-Asian tradition of leveret marriage, whereby the wife of a deceased man will marry a younger relative, which, of course, is a tradition that is condemned by many religions and cultures. In China, for example, the Han literati knew about the custom going all the way back to the Xiongnu, and they always condemned it as incest. Yet from the Xiongnu to the Turks to the Mongols, it was a key component of steppe life. One, moreover, that allowed women to maintain and build power uh, through the generations, since within the leveret system, they were able to keep their dowry and property. So in short, leveret marriage was a key part of ensuring the power and independence of Mongol women. Thus, when Buddhism came in and outlawed it, the power and attendant status of Mongol women basically collapsed. And indeed, to my knowledge, after Queen Jongin, who was without a doubt the most powerful Mongol, male or female, in the late 16th and early 17th century, we never hear again of Mongol women in the historical record. In the Qing record, it's like zero. So in other words, becoming Buddhist institutionalized patriarchy in a new way in Mongol society. And thus, can we definitely say that becoming Buddhist did actually, and, I mean, so we can definitely say that becoming Buddhist did change Mongolian culture and society. But again, we can ask for the better or for the worse. And again, in, when we look at these changes, admittedly, it may not be as we had imagined it to be, much less wanted it to be. But either way, it shows, or at least I think it does, it shows that there was a process whereby the Mongols did actually come under the sway of Buddhist thought and practice. Or more specifically, that Buddhist religious values had a direct impact on the cultural 
and social practices of the Mongols. Of course, as noted above, the main thrust of much Buddhological scholarship on this process has looked at it from the other side of the equation. Namely, how did Tibetan culture, or Burmese culture, or Japanese culture transform or bend Buddhism to its own mandates, whereby we can in turn talk about separate realities such as Tibetan Buddhism, Burmese Buddhism, and Japanese Buddhism. As a result, what I want to explore today is the dynamic of acculturation from this perspective, namely whether there was some cultural system or set of values and practices that resulted in the tantric Buddhism of Tibet to become Mongolized. And in exploring this question, what has recently intrigued me, as with the question of lever at marriage, is the question of Mongol law. And as such, I readily admit that my own work is greatly indebted to all the other scholars in Buddhist studies who are exploring this dynamic across Asia. Thus, one concern of mine is how does the case of Mongolia correspond to or deviate from all of these other Buddhist cultures in the realm of law? Moreover, a further question is how does the interaction of the Dharma with Mongol jurisprudence shape the history of the law and Manchu rule up through the Qing? Since, as some of you may know, this question, or more specifically, the history of Mongol law during the Qing, has recently been the focus of several excellent works, most notably those by Dorothea Huschert in Germany and Ying Hu, who wrote her dissertation at Stanford uh, with Matt Sommer as her advisor. And as these works and others show, the history of Mongol law during this period is an inextric inextricable move away from indigenous Mongol law in the early Qing to a largely Chinese-style legal system by the 19th century or what we may want to call the process of Qingification, which was the focus of my book, Our Great Qing, The Mongols, Buddhism, and the State in Late Imperial China. Yet in that work, I did not address the intersection of Buddhism and the law. And thus, an inevitable question, especially considering the so-called Buddhist explanation, which I claim is you know, that, that the Manchus use Buddhism to control the Mongols, we need to ask, what role, if any, did Buddhism play in the Mongol legal system during the Qing? Since clearly, as scholars of Buddhism and law elsewhere have shown, it is precisely in the quotidian realities of jurisprudence that Buddhism as a lived reality is practiced and forged. To this end, I looked at, the th at three extant law codes that we have uh, from the conversion in the late 16th century until 1640, which I thought should ideally reveal not only what influence the Dharma actually had during the fervent period of the newly converted, but as such, it would also set a bench line for the Mongol Buddhist legal practice practices prior to the Manchu conquest and whatever process of Qingification it sub subsequently entailed. And for those unfamiliar with this material, these include the so-called Law of Altan Khan, which is preserved in Tibetan and has been published by Bira, the so-called 18-step laws, which were our laws compi compiled among the Halk during the early 17th century and that have been preserved on birch bark manuscripts and recently published by Nasilov. And the third source is the well-known Mongol Oirat Code of 1640. Of course, I imagine some may be wondering why I have not included the well-known white history, which is presumably a work from the late 16th century but that basically lays out the laws and social structures of an idealized Buddhist state. And it's precisely for this reason, namely that it is an idealized vision of a Buddhist state, um, that I don't want to use it. Um, because none of the things that were found in the white history are actually put into practice and thereby discounts it for serious consideration as a source for us to understand how Buddhism actually impacted Mongol legal practice. Thus, if we look at these three works in terms of their respective Buddhist influence, what can we say? The first thing we can say is that all of them righteously begin with the obligatory pains to the Dharma, as you can see in these two opening passages from the Altan Khan Code and the Mongol Oirai Code. Unfortunately, the introduction to 18-step laws, if there ever was one, is no longer extant. Regardless, what is obvious from these two introductory passages, especially in the case of Alton Khan's code, which powerfully brings forth the well-known Buddhist principle, namely the so-called the two realms, is that at least in word, if not in deed, the Mongols had truly converted and did, did apparently take the Dharma quite seriously. So much so, in fact, that it would not seem wholly unreasonable to assume that Buddhism was therefore going to play some kind of role in Mongol legal practice. Yet, as Bira noted long ago, after this grandiose Dharma-inspired introduction, the law code of Altan Khan does not actually have any regulations reflecting what we may call Buddhist thought or action. 
nor does it even have any laws concerning the Sangha, monks, Buddhist institutions of any kind. Rather, what the law code of Altan Khan contains is essentially the standard laws of me medieval Mongol society that covered such things as the maintenance of social hierarchies, homicide, theft, marriage, family law, slander, maintaining the post relay system, hunting, fugitive, and other various things. Thus, in short, what the Altan Khan code tells us is that in the late 16th century, or in other words, during the decades right after their conversion, that Buddhism had basically no impact on Mongol law. Namely, Mongol law continued precisely as it had in the Ming period, as we, are, as we know um, from the evidence preserved in the Sino-Mongol treaties that were built on Mongol legal systems and studied extensively by Henry Sorois. Yet on a certain level, that is not entirely, entirely true either. Since we know from the Jewel Translucent Sutra, the history of Altan Khan and his descendants from 1608, that there was one law specifically proclaimed upon the Mongols' conversion to Buddhism, and this law is also found in, in Tibetan sources as well, which, as the passage cited here shows, was the persecution of shamanism. And I confess that when I look at this passage now, what surprises me is the gendered nature of the persecution. Thus, while the shamans were killed, the shamanesses were apparently humiliated. What this actually means, I can only speculate. However, I do not think that suggesting rape would be too far off the mark. Regardless, what this passage and numerous other sources from this period do make clear is that the killing and humiliation of shamans and shamanesses was not only acceptable, but mandated in the new Buddhist dispensation. And as we can see from this 19th century Tonka from Outer Mongolia, the annihilation of shamans was part and parcel of the narrative that defined the conversion of the Mongols to Buddhism. Since what this painting portrays is the meeting of Altan Khan and the third Dalai Lama, which as captured here included the burning of a shaman, or maybe one of the Anongun, one of these shamanic felt dolls. Either way, as we know from later Qing sources, this was not simply a visual or a rhetorical flourish. Rather, up through the 18th century, we have records of Mongol noblemen killing shamans and not being persecuted for this act of killing. One example is Norbu Sangbu of the Horchin right flank middle banner, who rounded up all the shamans in the 10 banners of the Jiren League and burned them alive on a wooden pyre. And rather than being punished for this act, he was lauded by the Qing authorities. Of course, to put this into a larger context, it is important to note the reality of Mongol law regarding homicide, which in short is that murder is not allowed. Moreover, unlike Chinese law, Mongol law did not generally condone capital punishment, even for murder. Rather, the punishment more often than not entailed payment, with the question of how much and to whom invariably revolved around the people involved and the mandates of maintaining the strict social hierarchy that defined Mongol society, and thus Mongol law. So a, Mon a nobleman killing a commoner or a slave would require a small payment or none at all, while the killing of a nobleman by a commoner or a slave would require a heavy payment, including quite possibly the perpetrator's life. Thus, in sum, what we can conclude from all this is that the legalization of murder in the case of shamans was one Buddhist transformation of Mongol law that predated Chinese influences. Though it was not the only one. Rather, as this collection of statutes from the Mongol Oirat co codes convey, the legalized persecution of shamans continued throughout the preaching period. Moreover, as the detailed nature of these regulations reflect, such as the identification of the specific animals used in rituals, as well as the status of the people involved show, the jurisprudence regarding shamanism actually became more and more detailed and sophisticated over time. And in a sense, we see the same dynamic at play in the case of the Dharma as a whole. Thus, unlike in the case of Alton Khan's law code, wherein Buddhism is never mentioned in any fashion whatsoever, in the 18 step laws that were compiled during, uh, among the Hulk in the decade or two later, there is at least a recognition of the Dharma. In particular, it makes clear that both Buddhist specialists, namely monks and lamas, as well as their religious institutions and belongings need to be respected and not trifled with. So much so, as you can see in the first statute here, that even the nobility would be gravely censored for affronting the Dharma in any way, and commoners would even be killed. Which again, considering the Mongols' general avoidance of capital punishment, even in the empire period, which um, 
that is actually quite remarkable. Indeed, the introduction of capital punishment and various forms of physical punishment is one of the key elements that scholars note as defining the process of Qingification, whereby Mongol law became more and more Chinese. Yet, as we can see in the case of the 18 step laws, the introduction of capital punishment actually occurred earlier, and specifically in regards to slandering or defaming the Dharma. Yet, curiously, and for unknown reasons, this harsh punishment was subsequently modified, or perhaps more aptly toned down, in the Mongol Oirat Code of 1640. Thus, slander or insults to various individuals in the Buddhist hierarchy would again only be punished by the traditional norms of compensation, as you see here. Moreover, as you can see with the final statute, even in the case of murder or the theft of Buddhist pro property, the punishment was still only compensation. Of course, a heavy one, especially if one was to lose absolutely everything one owned. Nevertheless, I think this shift is interesting to note. However, I regret that I currently have no good explanation for why this happened, though I look forward to hearing any suggestions that you may have. Before then, however, I want to say something about this ruling about the destruction or taking of Buddhist property, which, if nothing else, does provide us with evidence that Buddhists, namely monastics, were in fact a part of Mongol society at this time, and thus rules needed to be created in case they were violate, violated in various ways. Yet invariably, rules have to be promulgated not only regarding their violation, but also to ensure the viable functioning of Buddhism as a part of Mongol society. And in this regard, the 18 step laws are interesting since they include a great deal of laws pertaining to the post-relay system, which was, a crucial to, which was crucial to the maintenance of both political, uh, Mongol, Mongol political order and social cohesion. And since monks and lamas were invariably moving around in Mongol society, it is perhaps unsurprising that laws were established to ensure the proper roles and functions of all involved. Thus, as you can well imagine, monks did not have to provide labor for the post -relay, postal relay system. Moreover, they were expressly allowed to use the system to fulfill their religious role of traveling to their followers across the steppe. Thus, as you can see in the laws here, lamas were allowed to requisition three cards, while novices were only allowed two cards. <coughs> Yet at the same time, as monks did not have to work for the relay system and could use it themselves, monastics were also, surprisingly to my mind, mandated to provide fodder and carts to noblemen who were themselves traveling through the system. Again, revealing the importance of maintaining the social hierarchies of Mongol society. A uh, scene uh, as well in the fact that if people of lesser rank tried to take such privileges, they were themselves punished. Thus, in conclusion, based on these examples, what can we say about Buddhism and Mongol law in the preaching period? Clearly, we can say that Buddhism, or that based on our scant legal sources, that Buddhism was in fact a part of Mongol society at this time. However, as to how, and to what extent the Dharma actually shaped Mongol law, and thus by, the ex by extension, the quotidian reality of everyday life, the situation is less clear. Indeed, the material I presented here is pretty much all there is regarding Buddhism in these three early preaching Mongol law codes, which to my mind seems quite sparse, if not even trivial, considering the import we place on Buddhism in Mongol history. Indeed, when I look at these sources, I keep asking myself, shouldn't there be more? And I ask this question since, as we all know, so much of the scholarship on the Mongols during this period, and especially during the Qing period on account of what I've called the Buddhist explanation, that this sparsity of the Dharma and the Mongol legal system seems somehow odd. Indeed, in the case of the law, in both the pre-Qing period and during the Qing, Buddhism seemingly plays a very marginal role. Thus, yes, we can find evidence of these pre-Qing Buddhist laws continuing into the Qing period, especially in the two earliest Qing Mongol law codes, the Mongu Luli of 1696 and the Khalq Jirim of 1709. However, as with the earlier preaching legal codes, the dharma in both of these legal codes largely has to do with rights and property and slander, 
and not necessarily the more profound changes that could be construed as part of a dynamic of indigenization, such as is the case with the introduction of intent, which is an essential aspect of Chinese law and that permeates late Qing, late Qing Mongol law as evidenced in the Li Fan Yuan Zili. Thus, if we return to the question raised above, did Mongol society change Buddhism? What can we say based on the example of Mongol law? In asking this question, it is important to recognize that the creation and maintenance of legal systems is an important part of any project of state consolidation. And thus the general absence of the Dharma in Mongol law from the 16th up through the 19th century should force us to once again rethink the role of Buddhism in not only Qing rule, but also in Mongolian society as a whole. Indeed, if we really want to understand the full complexity of Mongolian Buddhism, perhaps we need to look at the intersection of the Dharma and Chinese law during the Qing, a project that would invariably dovetail well with similar dynamics happening in Tibet during this period as well, which would, of course, open up new and important perspectives on Qing rule in the frontier. Yet clearly, such a project is far from where we began and the issues revolving around the quest to better understand Mongolian Buddhism better. Nevertheless, I think the case of Buddhism's apparent lack of impact on Mongol law needs to be considered as we try to make sense of Mongolian Buddhism. And in doing so, I th think that we can potentially say that this apparent lack of impact may be nothing more than me being blinded by my own straw man, namely the Buddhist explanation. Or in other words, Qing rule of the Mongols involved much more than simply supporting Gelugpa Buddhism, which on one level is obvious. And thus the old complaint about Manchu Buddhist colonialism clearly needs to be revised. Yet at the same time, I also think that the general absence of the Dharma in Mongol law from the 16th century into the Qing belies something more, especially when we put it in the context of the contemporary revival. As anyone who's been to Mongolia, one always hears the criticism from both Mongols and Westerners that Mongolian Buddhism is nowadays all about just rituals, apotropaic rituals. Of course, on one level, this is again the old Humean two-tier Protestant critique. But in many ways, it is also invariably true. And thus, I would like to suggest that when we think about Mongolian Buddhism, we really need to ponder about where it resides, especially when we move beyond the bounds of the nobility and the clerical elite who are clearly part of the Manchu imperial machinery and thus have their own interest in the promoting the Dharma and also the ones who left us sources that we can actually read. Indeed, for the common herder on the steppe in either the 18th century or today, what was or is Mongolian Buddhism? I look forward to hearing your answers. Thank you.